Good morning. Think about whatever the events of your morning were and what gave, you, what gave you joy this morning. What made you smile? What made you just say, oh, life is good? So just think about that for a second and maybe share that with a neighbor beside you. What's your little snippet of your morning that, that gave you some joy? So share that around. People who are online with us this morning, feel free to type that in the chat and uh, let's Let's reflect on what gave us joy this morning. I hear the chatter starting to die down. So for those of you who are joining us, welcome, come on in. We were just, uh, we we're just talking about our moments of joy. And I've, uh, the couple of moments of joy that I had this morning were, I went up, we have a loft in our third story of our house and we have two cats that can be quite annoying in the morning. And so sometimes my son in morning fury runs the cats and throws them up in the upstairs room and locks the door so that they can't continue to bother him before he's ready to wake up. So I was up first this morning after he had put the cats upstairs and opened the door and two cats happily bounded out of the door like nothing was wrong in the world. And it just gave me this moment of joy that I, I smiled on. And then I was downstairs cooking my toast, burning my toast. And my husband came down and said, are you making a sacrifice to the Lord this morning? <laughs> so these were a couple moments of joy that I was reflecting on. And I think the thing about these moments is that I, hopefully you had this experience as you thought back on your morning. But, you know, so many times we have these little moments that happened and we recognize, yep, that made me smile, or that was a good thing, but they're gone instantly because they're just little tiny moments and we don't take time to notice them. And so I think it's just so important, like this is just a little trick that you can do, and if you learn to recognize those moments and savor them, then they become significant. So rather than just thinking through, oh, I burned my toast this morning, uh, or whatever it was, the cats were so annoying and, and woke me up at four o'clock, uh, if you can recognize those little moments and savor them and think about them, then they actually become meaningful. And, and uh, it's a way to just kind of change around um, what, uh, what, your, what your memories are. So however you are coming to church this morning, whether that's joyful or perhaps burdened or excited or contemplative or just waking up, God really longs to meet you here uh, this morning. So I have to tell you, when I was just kind of preparing for this morning, I wasn't actually feeling that joyful. I was feeling kind of burdened with, uh, you know, I, I think of sometimes the feelings that we carry around in the day. We have a backpack, and so whatever it takes to bustle out the door in the morning, when you burn your toast, when the cats woke you up, you throw that in your backpack for the day and you carry that around. And those are just sort of your day-to-day -day things that you carry around. But then there's the big things that you carry around sometimes too. So like climate change or racism or name kind of these big pressing issues and those go into the backpack as well too. And so I was, that was what my, I was kind of feeling heavy with that backpack of things that I was carrying around. And so before I tell you a little bit about my devotions this morning, I just have to tell you 
Earlier this week, I was at a meeting here at church, actually, with a couple of folks from Calvary, and uh, someone shared with me just a difficult conversation that they were having throughout the week, and then they labeled sort of these weighty big topics that, that we get caught up in. Sometimes they, they, they label these as gods, and sometimes we give them power over us, and they become bigger than, than what they really are, and uh, so, but what we really need to do is recognize that our God comes first and he is bigger and stronger and mightier than any of these gods are that we can uh, sometimes build up in our minds. So that's the precursor to my morning. So I wanted, I ended up reading um, Psalm 86. So you'll know sort of what my frame of reference was. It was feeling kind of burdened, feeling heavy. And starting in Psalm 86 at uh, verse 4, it says, bring joy to your servant, or sorry, bring joy to your servant, for to you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. So I read that, and that's when I just had this moment of reflection about joy and to recognize the joy that was all around me. You are forgiving and good, O Lord, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord, listen to my cry for mercy. In the day of my trouble, I will call to you, for you will answer me. And then this is the next verse. Among the gods, there is none like you, O Lord. And that that verse just jumped out to me, and, and I remembered the conversation that had happened earlier in the week. No deeds can compare with yours. All the nations you have made will come and worship before you, O Lord. They will bring glory to your name. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. So my morning just turned around from that this passage and recognizing this passage and where I had been and... God spoke to me about, I'm here with you, put me first in your life, and I will help you through all these other pieces, and I am getting to announcements, <laughs> but what, uh, what I was recognizing is that God's voice in this particular situation, it was in that conversation that I had had earlier in the week, was what sparked that, that thought in me. So at Calvary, we've been talking a lot about um, being coming together as a body and, and using our gifts, and there are lots and lots of opportunities to get involved here. So first of all, awesome that you are here this morning, and to be part of our community is a, is a really wonderful thing. To people who are online, we just invite you to join in through the chat and be part of, um, be part of this conversation and our, and our interactions together as a body. Um, so I want to tell you about some of the awesome things that are going on this week. Um, on Tuesday, the, our, we have a 50s plus group that is our seniors group, and they are doing an event called Sweet Music. So they've got a music therapist coming in, and she's going to bring a guitar and some other instruments, and it sounds like a really great time of fellowship um, together, and, and there's going to be dessert afterwards as well, too, so we would invite you uh, to come out to the, that event. On next Sunday, you need to be here on Sunday because we're going to be having a chili cook-off. So this has been a couple years uh, on pause, so we're pretty excited to have this back um, in our community. And I hear that there's one more spot available, so if you had been thinking about making a chili, uh, we would love to have you enter your chili uh, into our chili competition. So please uh, reach out to Rhonda or Kelly to sign up for that. And if you're not into making chili, um, just come on, come on out anyways. Um, you can bring some. Uh, you could bring some bread or some salads. Desserts, I hear, always go over well. Um, so that's a way to get involved um, next Sunday. We do have a men's group that has been going on, and they've been on a little bit of a pause, but it's about to start up again on February 21st. So men, mark your calendars. I understand that that has been a really incredibly rich time of community. Um, and that's resuming, uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. 
And if you are here at Calvary and you are new to Calvary or new-ish, we use the word new in a very broad, uh, broad sense, but we, we're beginning a group uh, that's called Elements, and it's starting next Thursday evening, and it's just a way to kind of connect in, to learn a little bit more about Calvary, um, learn what the heartbeat is of, is of our church, connect in with some of our staff members. It's going to be a three-week session. Um, again, please reach out to Rhonda if that's something that sounds uh, interesting to you, and know that if perhaps you didn't receive a personal invitation to that, you are invited, and that is something that we are really hoping that people will come and plug into. Um, one more thing that I just want you to put on your calendars is our AGM is coming up, and so that's going to be our, the last Sunday in February, February 26th going to happen right after the service, uh, so more details are going to come about what that will look like, but that is just a really great time that we come together as a church, um, and we reflect back and celebrate some of the goodnesses that have happened uh, over the past year, so that will be uh, a time that we do that together uh, as a church body, and you probably saw this if you received the Calvary connects a, l a little electronic newsletter that goes out, but we did end last year. We went into December with a $65,000 deficit, and we ended December just at a $5,000 deficit. So our God is a good God, and we are excited uh, to celebrate um, what our last year was, and, but more importantly, what our, what our year to come is. So... See, I told you I'd get to announcements. I, I'm going to just uh, lead us in prayer here as we uh, enter into worship, and the worship team will um, lead us forward in some songs and some praise. So, God, Father, thank you so much for your goodness and the way that you see us and you hear us and that you know exactly what we need, God. I thank you for the way that you are full of graciousness and love, and you reach out and intervene in our lives in ways that are so powerful and meaningful. God, I pray that you would open our eyes to your presence around us. I pray that you would help us to be looking for opportunities to connect with you, to recognize you, to connect with others and, and point others to you. God, I thank you for your presence in this place this morning. Thank you for your comfort and your peace that you lavish so generously on us. God, I pray for um, your glory to be felt here this morning. I pray for that, that each person here would be would be um, would walk away from this place knowing that you are active, you are powerful, you are God of the universe, and you care deeply about each and every one of us. I thank you for the love that you abundantly pour on us. In your name we pray, amen. Would you pray with me? Hmm. Jesus, right now, right in this place. Come and meet us. The one who holds within his hands the heaven and the earth, hold us. Come, bend near us. Hmm. Come breathe upon us right now. Yeah, I just invite you uh, just to quiet your hearts, maybe take some deep breaths. If you're aware that you were carrying some weights coming in this morning, to, uh, just let them go.
And God, we invite you. (laughs) Show us your glory. Even if we don't know what that means, even if we, (laughs) even if that just sounds like a word, come and show us yourself. In Jesus' name. (laughs) Amen. I feel like there's a bit of feedback up here, Steve, but that might just be because I was speaking quiet and so you were ramping up my voice. I bet that's what it was. Wow. Uh, take a second. Uh, if, if you're still in that glory space, stay there, because that's ideally where we would, we would be, where we sense God's presence with us, we sense draw gone, drawing close to us, and we together help each other go, oh, I am A, not alone, B, I'm chosen by God to be filled by him. Uh, he loves me and believes in me, and he delights in where I am right now, but he also delights in where he is leading me. So if you can get in that space, ignore everything I say for the next bit and just stay there because that's, that's where we want to be. If these words will help you get there, that's kind of the goal too. So if uh, I'm going to give a moment where you're going to share a question with each other. Uh, if you're just one of those people that doesn't want to share with other people and you just need to be on your own, l- look like you're just receiving lots of glory right now and people will not share with you, okay? So the question is, what was your first word? Do you know? And if you don't remember, your, first, you know, your family didn't tell you this was your first word. Mine was yogurt. Um, w- to the disappointment of my parents, I will add. Um, what was your first word? Or maybe what was your child's or your grandchild's first word if you're having trouble? And again, nobody else knows, so you can make it up. Okay. <laughs> Mine was archaeologist, <laughs> whatever it might be. Okay, share with somebody around you. Do you remember your first word or what, when you were a parent, what your child's first word was, your grandchild's, your nephew's, your niece's? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, for you, for you extroverts out there, it's okay to get up and move around and talk to somebody else, get to know other people. The goal of us being together is so that we are together, caring for one another, supporting one another. If you're online watching, it's okay to throw it in the chat my, and brag or whatever. Why do parents get so excited longing for their child to speak their first word? What's that about? Like, is it because as soon as the child says their first word, mama, dada, you know, R-E-S-P, whatever, whatever it is their child says first, is it, because the, is it because the parents are like, oh, finally, I was worried that you would never speak and then you would never get a job and then you would never have money to provide for me when I get old. Is that, is that what it is? No, of course not, right? The, the reason we get so excited to hear God, to hear our child's voice is because suddenly we can start to communicate with them and them with us on a whole new level, right? They are learning our language and we are learning theirs. And suddenly you go from trying to figure it out, trying to pick up what they're saying. We had one child whose way of communicating when they wanted attention was to stick their fist down their throat until they threw up. We were very delighted when speaking started to happen because it's because we want to communicate, whether it's good and it's like, I love you, or even when it's like, I'm hurting or or I'm hungry or whatever it is, we want to know this, right? If we think of prayer as just another task to do, it's just going to feel like a weight and a burden. The reason that God invites us to pray is because God wants that connection with you. God wants you to learn how to speak to him and vice versa. God wants to hear your words, your heart, 
your needs. And God wants you to hear his heart, his desire for you, his calling on your life. And that's what prayer is. Prayer is not in, like we've been talking about spiritual practices and disciplines, prayer is not a discipline. Prayer is a language of intimacy. But it is something that we learn. Like a child, uh, you know, their first couple words, you learn a couple words. And then as you grow more, you learn how to do it more, and you learn what works and what doesn't work. And we learn to listen, and we learn to talk. It's a learned thing, but it's about intimacy. All of the other spiritual practices, from scripture to serving to um, what, whatever else, all of those are intended to be tools to help you pray. Not pray to God where you just talk at God. It is about intimacy. That's our goal. Imagine a couple who have been dating, not talking. You know, you know when you remember the honeymoon stage of a relationship. Do you remember that? Like, and if you go back to my date, uh, do you remember how your ear hurt? You spent so long on the phone. Do you remember that? Like, leaning against the phone. Oh no, let's keep talking. I'll just lie in bed here, and we can fall asleep. Did you ever? No, you never. I we didn't do that because Tracy. <laughs> Tracy is far too practical for that, but, <laughs> but you know what I mean, that love language? Or, 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 or like uh, when Trace comes home from work and we get to home from work, we love to just sit down and talk. We connect. It doesn't have to be about anything special. It's about, you know, like how the day went. Maybe there's funny stories. Maybe there was nothing significant. Maybe it's just connecting, there's not a lot happening, but there's this moment where we just get to like reconnect, right? Do you have that with someone? And if you don't, we would love to help you get into a small group, a group to, so that you're connecting with people because God meant us to do this together. But that picture, whether it's a child, whether it's someone you love, the picture of communication, connection is the heartbeat of prayer. And I want us, more than anything else, I want us to be hung, stir up a hunger in us for that. There's no shame if you feel like, oh, I don't know if I have that kind of prayer relationship with God. I hope that it stirs up a hunger in you because God is like a parent looking at you and going, oh, I long to talk with you. I can't wait until you start to find your words of prayer. And it's just delight. It's just the connection, and it doesn't have to be about anything huge or glorious. It can be about what happened in your day, but it's the connection that starts something profound and moving. The one who holds the, us in his hands, the heaven and the earth, is holy, but loves to hold us and speak to us. Hmm. Uh, prayer is not a practice then. It's about a relationship. So I want us to go to the, um, I left my phone. Look the other way for a second. I want us to go to the first slide, if you can pull that. Next slide after that. There we go. So we're not going to put, if you want, turn to Luke 11. We're going to get there. Um, if you want to you know, grab your thing, I think on the Pew Bibles, it's page 735. But here's this thing that's happening leading up to Luke 11. Jesus Multiple times in scripture it says Jesus often went off on his own into the wilderness to pray. And the reason it's in there, and it shows up multiple times, is because Jesus had this as a regular practice. The more, in fact, that Jesus' ministry ramped up where he was healing more, teaching more, crowds were coming, the more he, it, it seemed like the more he would disappear. And the disciples are, where did you go? Oh, he's off praying again. You know, when there's work to be done, right? Jesus often went off to pray, to communicate, to connect with God. I think that if we got to hear some of those prayers, it would just be like, you wouldn't believe what so-and-so did today. Or, you know, it wasn't always profound and deeply religious. Jesus loved to connect with God. And he knew that Getting away was the way that he got filled with power, filled with peace, filled with his presence, got connected so he knew what God was doing. That's what it's about. Hmm. Wow. 
So go to Luke 11, 1. One day, one day, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples to pray. See, the disciples have been noticing this connection between Jesus and him going away on his own to be with the Father, the connecting, the, the hearing, the listening, the talking. And when Jesus comes back, his power, his peace, his presence, all of the things that was Jesus was doing. If you go back one chapter, the disciples had been sent out by Jesus to go and do ministry, and they've come back. And the disciples are doing, Jesus isn't with them, but he filled them with his spirit, and they're out doing the things that Jesus did. And I think what happened in that ministry trip, and if you've ever done this, you know, somebody says, go off and do this on your own, and you get there and you go, I don't know what I'm doing. How, how does he do it? I'm exhausted. I'm doing all this work for him, and, and like things are happening, but how did he keep his peace? How did he keep that stillness? How did he keep his authority? And they started to put this together. Wait, when Jesus goes off to pray and the, how Jesus is with them. And so they come up to him and they're saying, Jesus, teach us. We need this. I'm hungry for this. I, if I'm going to keep doing what you're asking us to do, I can't do it without whatever secret it is you have. Teach me to pray. A couple things I want you to notice here. Um, in Luke 11... The disciples are saying, teach us to pray. And then they say, like John taught his disciples to pray. So I want you to see two things. First of all, there's a hunger in them, a recognition that Jesus has something I don't have that I need. But secondly, there's this thing of like, like Jesus, John's disciples got taught too, right? Uh, there's a sense of like, well, John's, John's disciples, John was Jesus' cousin, and he was doing ministry too. John's disciples got a prayer. And so they were feeling also like, oh, first of all, we're not as good as, and, and Jesus, there's something that's lacking, that's missing. And then there's the second of all that we go to that our mixed motives are like, they're better than I am, right? I'm not enough. And so they kind of whine at the same time. Here's what I want you to know. You don't have to have perfect motives to come to Jesus and say, I'm lacking something I need from you. Here I am. Would you teach me? You don't have to have it all together. The disciples there, there's, I think, they're a little bit of like, me, me, me. And Jesus still tells them, let me, let me teach you at least the starting of how you can talk to God like I do. And he goes into the Lord's Prayer. Do you just for a moment look around the people that are praying and think, I want that. Or I don't have what they have. And God wants to use that to stir up our hunger, to make us realize, oh, somebody else has something more of God than I do, to make us hungry for more. And then, then it's okay to ask, would you teach me? It's okay. I don't know why, how church got this way, but often in church and Christian circles, there's this sense of like, if somebody has a learned a lesson from God that we haven't learned, that somehow we failed. And no, it's not that way at all. God shows us people around us that have a greater sense of peace or joy or hope or whatever to encourage us to ask for it. To encourage us to say, God, would you teach me that too? We're meant to help each other. And, and when we are lacking something to go, I need to learn that. It's God stirring you up, a hunger in you to long for more. <laughs> Mark Comer, um, we're, we're, I'm kind of excited about this. Uh, so it's a church in Seattle, and he was a, he's a pastor. He was a pastor of a church, also part of uh, um, several podcasts that a bunch of people have been listening to. But here's the key thing. Mark Comer, uh, he, he was a pastor of this big church, and he actually left it recently because he realized... Our church needs tools of discipleship so they can grow. And so he's created this, starting to create this whole website and free resources so that Christians can tap into learning to pray if it's to prayer, learning we, things we've been talking about here, learning to read the scripture, learning to how can we have resources so we can help each other grow. 
Um, and just uh, put this in the back of your brain, sometime at near the end of February, we get to be a beta test church, right? So we're going to be running a group heading into Lent for four weeks on learning to pray. So my hope this morning is that stirring in you is this hunger of like, oh, I want more. I want that peace, that, that sense of glory, that weight. Or I, when Amanda was talking at the beginning, I, I want to talk to God like that so when I'm feeling burdened, I come to God and I work it through with him and suddenly I feel like, oh, I know what to do. I hope the hunger in you is stirring because God wants us to learn more. That's the Holy Spirit stirring you. No matter how old you are, no matter how long you've been coming to church, there is something that God has been stirring in you. And the reason he's stirring in it in you is because he wants you to ask. I need something more, God. And then ask others, would you teach me? All right? So anyways, Mark Comer, this guy, he left his church so that he could start this movement. I mean, he's still connected to the church, but he moved away to do this thing. He talked about burning out in ministry. Like, he, he was doing as much as he could. He was, like, living for God, and he burnt out. And in that time of burnout, he, came, he remembered his, as a kid coming downstairs in the morning, and his mom would be sitting in her chair by the window praying. Every day when, when he would come down, he would always find her there, and he never really thought about it much, but his mother had been praying for years. And sticking in his brain in that moment of burnout was like, oh, that's what's missing. I, so, my mom had something that I need. And that's where, you know, so when he's talking about prayer, he's saying like, God places memories of you, like people around you that will spur you to long for more. Okay, we're going to go to Exodus 33. I'm going to cram a lot in here, but this is important. Okay, Exodus 33. It is page uh, 64 in your Bibles. We're going to Moses now. And here's what I want you to see with Moses. So again, it's the same thing as Jesus. Jesus, who has the presence and the glory of God with him, and the disciples say, Jesus, how do we get that? How do we get your presence? Your glory is so beautiful. How do we get that? In Exodus 33, the Israelites are wandering around in the desert over and over again, and God, has started, God and Moses are starting to talk, and God is saying, like, these people don't want me. And, me, and I'm going to lift my presence. And Moses gets desperate. He starts talking to God and he says, I can't go if you don't go with me. God, don't send me to lead this people. God, don't send me into the promised land. Don't, don't leave me. I need you. And he starts begging God for himself, but then he starts begging God for his people. God, our people, I know they don't know that they need you. I know that they're not hungry for you, but they need you. Don't leave us. So how is the, what's the response? I, I want to get this right. What's the response that Moses has? Moses is talking to God. He's desperate for the presence of God, the glory of God. And Moses uh, is talking to God about it. And you, sometimes, you know, you're looking at people and you're going like, why don't they get it? And like Moses sometimes gets grumpy and angry and, and, and even rebukes the people. But this time, he does exactly what Jesus does. This time, he talks to God and he says, what should I do? And so he goes and he sets up a tent right outside of the camp. And he calls it the tent of meeting. And Moses starts to go there every day. And when he goes there, the presence of God, like a glory cloud, descends upon the tent. And Moses talks with God face to face. And when the people saw the cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand and bow down in front of their own tents. Inside the tent of meeting, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face. It's the baby, the child, right? The dada, like he, Moses got that. As one who speaks to a friend. This is the language of prayer. And afterwards, Moses would return to the camp, but the young man who assisted him, Joshua, son of Nun, would remain behind in the tent of meeting. We'll leave that up there if that's okay. Uh, what I want you to see is that Moses recognizes the need and the hunger, for hunger in people, 
And so he sets up a tent and he starts to model prayer. He starts to go and daily spend time with God. Other people go to the tent of meeting too. It's not just when Moses goes. He sets it up as a place of meeting. And other people go like Joshua goes. And when Moses goes, it's a whole higher level. The glory of God descends. But people start to notice. And we get to hear where suddenly people notice when Moses goes off to pray, when Jesus goes off to pray, he gets filled with the glory and the presence of God. And when he comes back, he's shining. And they get hungry and they start to stand at the tent and they they go, this is a holy moment. We need this too. And they even bow down even where they are in their own tents. Over time, Moses stirs up a hunger in the people for the presence of God. So much so that one of his young men says, I'm not even going to leave this tent. This is so good being with God. And that young man who is not mentioned before this moment, because he loved the presence of God, becomes the next leader of Israel. That same hunger that Moses creates here is the same hunger that God wants to stir in you and I for more. If you have noticed somebody who has a better prayer life than you or, or has something of peace or joy or hope or comfort, it's to stir up a hunger in you. God is causing you to notice it because he wants more for you. Ask. And for those of you, and we're going to walk into some practical prayer things in just a moment. For those of you who have a prayer life, who have grown and you, you have, know about this, you know about going and spending time in the glory. Is it possible that God is stirring you this morning to set up a tent in your life somehow so that the people around you would notice the value and the power of you spending time with God that stirs people around you to go, I long for the peace that comes when that person spends time with God. I long for the joy or the hope or the vision that comes when they spend time with God. Perhaps God is asking, inviting you to go to the tent. Perhaps God is inviting you to set up a tent in your life. Can you slide to the next slide now? I'm whipping through. <laughs> so we asked a couple people, just like Moses stirring a tent. Let me just share a couple people. This is Crystal, who is, who is now, like, for people online, if you're sending prayer requests, Crystal is the one who's receiving your prayer requests. And Kelly said to Crystal, you know, when, when did the prayer shift from just, like, talking, like, the things, you, you know, by rote to relationship? When did this change? And she said... Hmm. She's so profound. I can't say as though I can put a date on it. Likely more when I started having kids and life got so hectic and busy. Isn't that great? Don't you think it would be like, oh, I went on this spiritual retreat and I got lots of time away and that's when it became? It's when we realize the need of it that it stirs us to long for it. It was the realization that I could pray at any time, anywhere, because I only had these little pockets of time. God doesn't just care how we pray. He just wants to hear us even if it's a two-second popcorn prayer. That means like, hear God. When you sprinkle in those little pockets, you actually spend more time with him in the day. Honestly, I feel like I'm having a constant conversation with God every day. And that is when it becomes a lot more intimate and he speaks sometimes a lot more quickly than you expect. Keep it simple has become my motto. Talk to God like you'd pick up the phone and talk to your good friend or parent. Come on, that's in our church. We got somebody like that. And if you're feeling it all like, oh, I don't have that. Well, that's God just saying, oh, I love that you're noticing you don't have that. I'm inviting you into more. There's no shame. There is no, God is not highlighting something you don't have to make you feel bad. God is highlighting something you don't have because he has more for you. All right, next one. This is Kathy, mayor of St. Jacob's. It's a, it's a, it's a joke, but literally she knows everybody. Okay, when I started to recognize physically the presence of the Holy Spirit when I was praying, but then that also moved into times when I wasn't sensing the presence of the Holy Spirit. That first shift happened when I started going to Thursday prayer group years ago, and specifically the soaking and being still, like just being still in God's presence. That intentional focus time was the catalyst for sure. Of course, it took me a while to actually recognize His presence, so grateful for his faithfulness, would also say that others talking about their own prayer experiences made me want that for myself. 
So she starts going to a group because there's more. And that's eventually she learns with it. We go to school to get more. Hmm. See, I started praying every day because I realized that my camp counselors when I was a teenager uh, had something I didn't have. And so I asked them, like, what am I supposed to do? And part of it was mixed up in one, I wanted to be, you know, a camp counselor like them, and like there was mixed motives. But I learned that setting aside time every day to spend with God is the key to everything else. In the, mix, in the midst of those times, there were times where it was so dry, so boring, you know, readings, but I learned to learn to pray. And I long for that for each of us. I long for us to have such a hunger to have an intimate connection with God. I long for us to be thirsty for more. I long to see that stirred up in us in such a way that we leave every week saying, oh, I need that person to pray for me because they've got more than I do. I need that, them, that person to teach me. Moses set up a tent and the presence of God came from Moses. Jesus says, here, let me show you how I pray. And then he goes into the Lord's Prayer. Let's just go to the next verse there. Hmm. Father, I deliberately didn't use the one that you've all memorized just to shake it up for us. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. Lead us not into temptation. Jesus says, start praying this way. I just want you to notice that it starts by looking at God. So if you can grab, did you grab those prayer sheets as you were coming in? If you didn't, could I have somebody available to put those around? Some of you know this. Again, this is just one pattern of prayer. If you don't have it, Jerry, would you mind, or Quentin's at the back there, just wave your hand and Quentin will make sure he gets you a sheet. Also, there's free journals back there. You probably noticed that every week I've been saying lately, hey, grab a journal or grab your notes and pay attention to what God stirs in you each week. Because God is speaking to you, even that maybe it'll be out of a song and not during this time. But start to pay attention to the things that God is stirring in you so that you don't forget it when you go off for lunch. But throughout the week, you start reflecting on the things that God is stirring in you. It's one of the ways we start to learn. All right. On the sheet, many of you know these things. Uh, we're going to have this online as well. We've actually trying, starting to create a, a part of our website that actually has spiritual disciplines, and we'll be fleshing that out over the next year or so with practices and things you can do because we really believe God's going to stir you about different things, and you're gonna, we want to have resources for you. But we're going to play a song and invite the band up now. And I just want to invite you to do this. Stop and come away. Make room. Let go of your concerns. We've been doing that all morning in our worship, leaving our heavy loads. And then he says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. You're the king. Would you come? The first half of the Lord's Prayer is just turning your attention to God, enjoying who he is, and being still. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. And then, he, then you start to pray about your needs. What needs? Be aware of the things and just, again, leaving your loads with God. Your provision, daily bread, forgiveness, God to lead you, not into temptation, but to deliver you from evil. And then look back again at God. Would you just take a few minutes as we sing this song? Either use that kind of list of things to do, begin with thanksgiving, or just use this simple stop, look to the Father, your needs. Use the Lord's Prayer to cue you to pray. Look at God, lay down your needs, look to God again. Jesus, I pray that you would draw us into the tent of meeting right now. I pray that you would descend in glory in this room. 
And as we wait upon you, that it would become personal, that we would see ourselves as beloved children of you, and that you look to us and just are delighted to hear us speak. We don't have to get it right. We're just learning. And whether we've been praying for years or starting for the first time, it does, you are just as delighted, just as excited for each one of us. So we look to you. We lay our needs before you. We listen for what you want to say to us. And we say, help us, go with us into this week. Take some time on your own. So there's some servers that have been asked to come up and serve, so I'll invite you to come forward as I introduce this. But here's what we're doing. I, I found it funny that Amanda came, started the service with weights, like the burdens that we carry, the weights, and then Aiden had something about weight that wasn't planned, that just happened. But did you know that in Scripture, the word for glory is weight? But instead of it being the weight of our lives, it's the weight of God coming upon us. When Moses went into the tent, when Joshua stayed in the tent, it was because the weight of God being close was greater than the outside pressure of the world. When the disciples came to Jesus, they said, the weight of ministering is too much. How do you do it? Teach me your secret. Teach me to pray. And so for us today, probably some of us are like, oh, that's it. That's what's been missing. I've only been praying a couple moments or I'm just talking at God or, or I need to learn something new about prayer to walk me through the season I'm walking in. God wants to draw close. God wants to carry the burdens and allow the weight of his glory to be what fills us, what rests upon us. He wants us to know his love and his mercy, his peace, the fullness of his presence. And he wants us to help each other in learning how to pray. I believe that this is a tent of meeting, this house. In fact, if you look up at the building, it's, it's sort of like a tent, really. When we come here, the purpose isn't to do your time at church and go. The purpose is to help, help each other draw close to Jesus. So Jesus, I pray that you would shift our thinking. That you would make us so desperate, so hungry for you. Whether it's out of what we're lacking or that we just want more. Thank you that that's you working in us to long for more of you. Jesus, with his disciples before he was crucified, took bread and he broke it. The one who is the bread of life, the one who was born at Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. <laughs> the one who took a couple loaves of bread and broke it and fed hundreds of people at, just before his crucifixion says, this is my body broken for you. Eat and remember me. He's inviting us to let Jesus feed us, to draw close, to receive his forgiveness, his mercy. And on the cross, he was lifted up and he was <laughs> crucified to take away every weight, every barrier that we have borne on our own on the cross. And he invites you and me to lay those things down this morning that they're here as we receive communion. God, I give you all these weights, shame, discouragement, fear, whatever it might be that's stirring up in you that's too heavy to carry, to bring it to him and say, thank you for taking it. I can't carry this alone. And you didn't ever mean me to. And after the meal, he filled up a cup and he thanked God and he said to his disciples, this is my blood poured out for you for your forgiveness. Hmm. Like the glory of God pouring out upon the tent like the, the people standing at their tents and seeing the glory of God fall so that they fell down. God wants to fill you and me 
Jesus said, I am the vine, and if you abide in me, you will be filled. It's all about connection. It's all about allowing him to be your strength, your comfort, your hope, your healing. And so today, as you come and you lay down the things, as you drink from the little plastic cup, <laughs> if God can fill that, God can fill you. That's what I'm saying. He's going to fill you up with his spirit, with his love, with his grace. Just get into a space where you're going, I need you. I'm hungry for you. I'm thirsty for you. Fill me up. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. We're going to worship a little bit and just let you receive. Um, if you want to come up, come up. Uh, how does that work again? Rhonda's going to explain it because she's better at that. Communion. That you offer yourself so freely. And we have a choice to receive. Thank you for this morning where we we're reminded that the weights that we're carrying are meant not that you cause them, but when we sense that there's things that are too heavy, it leads us to you, the one who carries our burdens. Thank you, Jesus, that you, you love for us to learn to walk with you. In this week to come, would you help us carve out space every day to stop? If we've been praying for five minutes to make it 10, if we've been praying for 20 to make it half an hour, just to step into more of you. But to learn to hear you and to talk to you and learn that intimacy. God, stir up a hunger in us that nothing else will satisfy. No TV show can numb out. No busyness of life can quench, but that we would know we need you. We're desperate for you. Oh God, don't send us out into this day without you. We need you to go with us. Make us hungry for you.